everybody. I would first like to thank everybody so much for allowing me to speak at this very exciting conference. My name is Nicole Kozlova, and I'm currently a student at Virginia Tech, studying computer modeling data analytics with minors in mathematics and statistics. Football has been a part of my life since I was a little girl with a big dream to play professionally. While I am completing my studies, I am also playing Division I soccer with the Virginia Tech women's soccer team. Sorry, we call it soccer over here. For the past few years, I have also had international duties with the Ukrainian national team. My passion for football and numbers led me to, well, this, football analytics, and I hope this is just a start for me in this ever-growing field. This summer, I had an incredible opportunity to work with StatsWAM, and I had the privilege of working alongside the data science team and learning something new every day. Although it was a big learning curve with many firsts, I was able to work on a project on a topic I, had a, I have had to learn a lot about on and off the field. High pressing has become a fundamental part of the game. The big risk, big reward is appealing to many teams and coaches. Win the ball back near the opposition's goal and you can quickly attack, never giving the other team time to be dangerous. However, it is easier said than done. The team pressing must work cohesively and if any one player doesn't buy in or misses their cue, the press break and the team may be left exposed in the back if the team in possession can escape their press and they are going to have numbers down in the back. Like many aspects in fo of football, pressing can be carried out by each team slightly differently. Breaking down and identifying pressing styles can be pretty complicated. They often overlap with each other and there's a lot of interchange going on between each style. You may be watching a game and notice quite an organized press being carried out or sometimes it honestly can look like complete chaos. So this struck some interest in me and I decided to dig deeper into the different styles of high pressing in football and narrowed my focus on teams who were often successful in each of their respective pressing styles. With no two scenarios in football identical, it can be hard sometimes to capture a tactical decision. And to limit that variation of different scenarios, I decided it was best to, best to look at what happens after a goal kick. When the game is in open play, it can get a bit hectic and unorganized. With the movement of the players off the ball and the decision making of the player on the ball, the picture on the field is constantly changing and one second it may look like one thing and the next second it's completely some, something else. So uh, players on the ball often have to adjust their, adjust their play to the current situation. So most of the time when the goalkeeper has the ball, the team defending can reset, reshape, and set their press. For some teams, that is dropping to its line of confrontation. For others, it is pushing everybody up, hungry to press as soon as that first pass is made. So let's quickly break down the five different styles I have identified and the teams that have, say, mastered it. If you have ever watched Pep Guardiola's team play, you know he loves to press. Wherever Pep goes, he gets his team to play high with great intensity, attempting to win the ball back as quickly as possible. As said by Pep, I want the ball for 90 minutes. When I don't have the ball, I go high pressing because I want to have the ball. So most recently, he has done this with Manchester City, a passing lane oriented high press. The goal of this style is to close off some passing lanes, but to keep others open. The result? Forcing the player on the ball to have limited options as well as making play for your own supportive players more predictable. The pressure is often applied to force a pass out wide. Next up, we have one that is carried out in a similar fashion, but the objectives of the press differ a little. There may be no manager better than Jurgen Klopp at the space-oriented press. A team without space to attack is a vulnerable team, and that is the goal of the style of press. Close down any space in the area of the, around the ball and not allow the team in possession any space to get out. Players defending will often sit in the pockets of space between the players of the team in possession, hungry to win the ball back as soon as a pass is made. You cannot talk about high pressing without mentioning Jesse Marsh, who gets his team to play a high intensity pre press that doesn't stop until the ball has been won back. My focus will be with the work he has done with Salzburg. His style falls under the category of a ball-oriented press. The focus is to keep the ball to one side and stay compact around the ball. The players on the other side of the field are not as dangerous and, and can be left open. 
even if a team attempts to play the ball across the field, it first of all is very risky, and second of all, even if successful, Salzburg has enough time to adjust and shift while the ball is traveling. Leeds United, the new team in the last EPL season, came out flying, playing a rigid man-marking oriented press. Each player must attempt to win their 1v1 battle for the press to be successful. With very tight marking, you can see lots of tackles, fouls, and duels occurring all over the field. A press like this often takes longer as it is more of an individual based press. And so as the team in possession progresses up the field and the space gets tighter, it becomes easier to win the ball back. Lastly, we have a man oriented press that is carried out by a fair number of teams. However, Bayern Munich, a very successful team, have done quite well with this pressing style. Most notably, most like the team which won the treble in 2013. Starting in a zonal defensive shape and quickly shifting to a man marking defender once the ball, once the forward initiates the press, or any other player for that matter. Each player getting tight to the player closest to them. Exploring the five teams of interest, it was clear to me that although all teams were high pressing, they were doing so differently. Simply looking at the pressure heat maps, it highlights a difference in pressing intensities around the pitch to reinforce the idea that pressing isn't a single homogeneous strategy and that it can be carried out in several different varieties. Essentially, the goal of pressing, which is to win the ball back and turn it into an attacking chance, is the same, but the mechanisms to create this differs from team to team, style to style. These heat maps highlight the pressure events recorded around the different zones on the pitch with color depending on the relationship to the league average. The darker the red, the higher they are than the league average. And, this is, and as you can see, all five teams are above league average in the attacking half, just showing the domination they have when it comes to high pressing. So we have identified the different styles which teams carry out most often, but can we now take the information we know and try to identify them using only events and stats bomb data? Could we capture these differences without looking at any video? To dive deeper into this, I decided to look at a few key things. Before any action in football, a player must also be thinking about what will happen next. A player receiving the ball must be aware of where their supporting players are, the defenders, and where the open space is to be able to get out of pressure as soon as they receive the ball. Sometimes that is to dribble out of pressure, take a big first touch, or just play a pass. The best players are always thinking a few steps ahead. The same applies to the player who goes to press the ball. Where are his or supporting teammates? Do they want to force the team to play wide or inside? Which player or space are they trying to cut off with their run? All these factors depend on what the team is trying to achieve with their press. With this in mind, I decided to look at a few things like where is the press being initiated and where is the pass after that initial pressure going? Looking at this, it can tell us a few important aspects of the press. Like, where on the field are they actually starting the press? Higher up, more centrally, wide? And are they forcing the player to go outside or inside? Although with the event data, you can't capture the angle of the player that, they, that is defending or the path of their run to press the ball, which is often curved, for example, if they want to force play to one side, looking at the heat maps allows us to see where the passes most often go after that initial press, which helps us paint a picture of the body shape and the run of the player pressing. We can see that if you're forcing teams to play wide or more centrally, or if the following pass is usually longer and teams are trying to escape the, te the team's press by playing a long ball. Again, all this depends on the team's goals, tactical decisions, and the current game plan. So before we analyze each one, I would like to reiterate what I have done. I created heat maps that looked at where to highlight team's tendencies off a goal kick. The first one looks at where that first pressure event is being recorded after a goal kick. And the second one looks at where the following pass is made after the initial pressure. So here you can see that Leeds United, who often play a very tight man marking press, often forces the opposition to either play a short pass centrally or bypass the initial line of pressure and, pl and play into the middle third of the field right off the goal kick. Leeds look to press the first pass made from a goalkeeper, no matter if it has gone short or longer. With the style being very rigid, the goal of the press is to create these 1v1 battles and win them. So where can these 1v1 battles occur? Out wide is the ideal place to isolate a player and create a 1v1, as you have the sideline helping you out and doing half the job for you because the space is limited. 
So you either want to push a player out wide or maybe to the center of the field, deeper into your own half, where play gets crowded with lots of supporting teammates and space is tight. On the contrary, Manchester City focused to close off some passing lanes and force play out wide, where they can win the ball back. And so the initial pressure is often near their goal and in the center to force the team to really make that following pass out wide. They also look to drop off and invite the goalkeeper to make the initial pass, a short, make a short pass, as they want to avoid that long ball. Inviting that short pass allows for City to really carry out their press very high up the pitch. If the team was to play a long ball, they now have to drop and defend deeper into their own half. We can say that they are quite successful to play because they have the opposition playing the ball where they insist, as most of the passes go out wide. Salzburg is a mixture of Manchester City and Liverpool. With a ball-oriented press, they want to make the field smaller by forcing play to one side. However, because it is focused on one move on duels, a lot more play happens closer to their half. So this is why we see that they are starting their press higher up the pitch centrally, but forcing those passes to go into passes to be a longer ball into the wide pockets, where these 1v1 battles can now also occur since they're a bit wider, closer to the sideline, and deeper into their own half. Once the ball has gone wide, they are also able to shift over and really focus on keeping the ball to one side and com committing players to that one side, leaving the not-so-dangerous players open. Now this is where things got interesting. From watching many games of Liverpool and Bayern Munich, it is apparent that the pressing styles are completely different. Liverpool trying to sit in the pocket of spaces and forcing the opponent to make a mistake with the little space they have. And Bayern Munich, on the other hand, may start in a more space-oriented press, but as soon as that pass is made or someone initiates a press, they quickly shift to a man-marking press. They seem to have different styles in mind, yet they turn out to have some unexpected similarities with their heat maps as well as other factors I explored and we will see that later on. Liverpool looks to invite the goalkeeper to make a short pass in their 18-yard box and press very high, at, very high right off the bat. With the rule change of goal kicks that allow passes to be make, made in the 18-yard box, this has been to Liverpool's advantage as they now can start their press very high and very quickly. So they're pressing that initial pass made in the 18-yard box, but Bayern Munich, on the other hand, also win the ball, fa ball fast, but will often let it go a bit wider and, and then they initiate the press from there. So they are often looking to force the pass either out wide for the one one battle to occur or back to the keeper. With a negative ball back to the keeper, the team can all step up and really commit numbers to the press. Forcing the team to play back after applying pressure can be agreed to be a job well done as the team has, never, has made no progress forward. With each team, Having a different approach, it was no surprise that each press starts out differently and each force a pass to a different area on the field. Each team favoring a particular part of the field over the other. Liverpool and Bayern Munich, as mentioned earlier on, turn out to be quite similar. However, Liverpool favors the center of the pitch more and Bayern Munich favors the right wing. Leeds, on the other hand, love to initiate their press in the center of the pitch starting very high up, but forcing the opposition to either play the ball short and be pressed or play a longer ball and still be pressed. So it's choose the, your battle. <laughs> City and Salzburg, on the other hand, love to press in the 18-yard box and in the wide a areas. City favoring the left wing and Salzburg favoring the right wing, which all at the end of the day comes down to personnel on each team and maybe the personnel on the opponent team. For Manchester City, the favored right wing could be because of Kyle Walker's ball-winning skills and his physical domination, as well as maybe Kevin De Bruyne favoring the right side, and since he's often the player to initiate the press. And he is also a player that City won on the ball once they actually won the ball back and are now attacking. So when you press the ball, you can be successful in many different ways. You can force the ball to be played in an area where your teammate is ready to win the ball, force the opposition to make a mistake, win the battle back, or just really disrupt play and create a foul, a free kick, or maybe even a throw in, for example. Of course, when, the when you press the ball, you must keep in mind a few things, as I previously mentioned. What is the objective of the press? Is it to force the play wide, maybe inside? Maybe you really want to force the team to play long and now battle a 50-50 ball. As a four, the player who initiates the press the most often, it is very important the shape of your body and the path of your run. 
The shape and angle a forward makes play more predictable and forces the team on the ball to play a ball in a certain area. Salzburg and Leeds, who love to press, press very aggressively with lots of numbers, often find that teams try to bypass their press by playing a long ball. They don't really like to take the risk of trying to play around them. And Manchester City, on the other hand, make sure that if they are pressing, that next pass is going to go out wide, which is done by the shape of the body of the forward pressing. They may curve their run and really cut off one angle. So they're forcing play to one side, and, this, and then the supporting players know what direction they should now help. Bayern and Liverpool often force the teams to play back to their goalkeeper, not allowing the team to make any progress forward. You can expect different outcomes from pressure on the ball. Like you can tackle, maybe fouls. When you press the ball, the most often outcome is always going to be a tackle, no matter the style, just because it is a defensive action. But the proportion does depend on where that pre on how the press is being applied. I would like to mention that originally I had each of these outcomes based on possession, but I was faced with an issue of bias, as these high pressing teams usually also are dominating possession, as they're constantly trying to have the ball, and did not really have to defend as many possessions against them. them. So I changed my focus to the proportion of each different outcome to the total number of defensive events allowed per each team. So it was very personalized. And this helped us capture the trends and tendencies of each team, seeing which factor they favored over the other. Take Leeds, for example, where 1v1 battles occur all over the pitch. The player either gets beat, puts a tackle in, in or fouls. So over half of the outcomes for Leeds are either a duel or a foul being committed. Manchester City and Liverpool, who are often sitting in the passing lanes or in the pockets of spaces, are expected to have less duels and fouls, trying to win the ball off of interceptions, loose balls, and blocking of the pass, or simply just a mistake from the opposition like a pass going out of bounds. Once again, we see the similarities between Liverpool and Bayern Munich, with similar proportions of each outcome. So, we have identified high pressing teams, broke down the five major pressing styles, but can we now identify these pressing styles just by with a random set of teams. To this, I combined, it, combined it all the important attributes for identify high pressing and carried out a principal component analysis. My first PCA included teams from many different leagues, and I used this to confirm that the teams I was looking at were indeed high pressing. For my second PCA, I took my five teams of interest, as well as a few other teams that I had researched to, play high, to be known to high press as well, and carried out another PCA with the same factors. So at first type, uh, similar fall, all, all the teams I looked at fall near each other on the PCA. Um, looking at this, it just confirms that all the pressures, they're really um, pressing, they're all in, pressing in the same player. We look where the pass goes after the pressure. And what is the most common outcome? Those were kind of all the factors in my PCA. And so taking on all these different important factors when it comes to pressing, we can see that my five teams um, all fall under kind of on the high pressing team. They're all on one side, except for Leeds. But Leeds really is a special case because they kind of press like no other team. The rigid man marking presser, um, press results in a lot of pressures, events being recorded all around the field and not just in their attacking half. As I mentioned earlier, the press tends to take longer since it's so individual. And so you see them pressing all over the field. So you can see that the five teams I have focused on and mastered their craft are all on one side. However, in the end, it seems that even though these teams may fall under the category of the same pressing style, the way it is carried out and the results are different when I put them together with many other pressing teams. This comes down to many different things. Taking things into account like personnel, skill and level of the player in the team and maybe the opposition team and what triggers they may have chosen to initiate the press and many many more other factors you can explore. Getafe and Salzburg are arguably both ball oriented pressing teams and seem to fall close to each other based on the factors I was explored in this paper. However they both like they both initiate their press and force play in a similar way as well as try to win the ball back in a similar manner with different similar proportions of outcomes. Manchester City and Real Sociedad, however, are a whole other story. Both being passing lane oriented pressing teams, but falling on completely different sides of the spectrum. So although they focus on blocking off specific passing lanes and forcing teams to, for the most part, play wide, Real Sociedad's press usually begins slightly wider than City's, 
And so all these slight differences make it very hard to analyze and identify the style of press being actually carried out with just using our event data. So unfortunately, event data is still slightly limited in capturing the full image of high pressing and being able to really nail down the style being played out. Teams often change their style throughout the game or just, just, adjust, their, or just adjust their defensive style for their opponents or maybe depending on which part of the field, they may employ a different style. Higher up, it might be more zonal, deeper into their own half, it'd become more man-marked. So two teams may fall under the same category, same umbrella, for example, of a man-oriented press, but one team looks to force play out wide, while the other team looks to force play inside, which could be because of personnel, numbers in the middle. And this changes the way the press looks completely and makes it very hard to identify that they are, in fact, the same style. However, from all the work I've done, there are many useful takeaways and a lot of potential. As teams prepare for games, taking a look at the opposition's tendency is key to being successful. I don't think a game doesn't go by where you're not doing a scout on your opposition and you're adjusting some of your game and making small tweaks to your upcoming opponents. So using the heat maps to understand and see the patterns of the initiation of the press will allow teams to plan how they would like to escape and play out of the back and maybe get out of this press. So for example, if a team knows that their defenders will be pressed immediately after they get the ball and forced to play the ball at wide, they can make sure that the fullbacks have supporting players as soon as they get the ball, which in most cases would probably be a holding mid. And if they're able to escape the press, this would be a very positive advantage as the team, as they're able to maintain possession, a lot of space and gaps open up in the attack as a team pressing really committed numbers and are left vulnerable in the back. All this, however, is just the beginning of the work that can be done with breaking down high pressing styles, which is key as more teams look to high press and it becomes a very important aspect of football. With the increasing amount of 360 data being collected here at Statsbomb, we will be able to find differences and similarities between each style and better identify the defensive styles teams play. When pressing, the supporting players are just as important as the players pressing the ball. It is a, it is a very team-oriented thing. Being able to see where teammates are supporting the player currently pressing the ball will help better our analysis of the high press. Also, being able to understand the context surrounding the ball will allow you to get a better image of really what, how and each style is being carried out. We could also look at things like how many players are surrounding the ball and maybe the average distance between each attacker and defender in the, in the, currently in the scene. So if the expectation of this is to, for it to defer between zo zonal focus press versus a tight man marking press. Thank you so much for listening to some, for some of the research I got to work on this summer with a great team here at Statsbomb. Sorry I couldn't be there in person as I have a game to play tomorrow, but I really do hope I have more opportunities like this in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>